want to stand before God unashamed? Here's one way that every believer can please God, by diligently studying His Word. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and it's true, God loves it when you read, study, and understand His Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Isn't that a great reason to show up today with your heart and Bible open? In our five-year study of God's entire word, we run across examples all the time of people who love God's word. And today, we're in the book of Ezra, definitely in the list of top ten people who love the Bible and who diligently worked at rightly dividing the word of truth or knowing how to rightly handle the word. We'll learn more about the character and practice of Ezra the scribe, as we'll call him, in our study of the book of Ezra, chapters 7 and 8. If you've been on the Bible bus, what Dr. McGee called this five-year journey through the whole word of God, then you know that for over 50 years through the Bible has been on the air. Even before through the Bible, Dr. McGee taught the Bible on the radio, and like Ezra, he gave his whole life to the study and teaching of the word. And now listeners in virtually every country of the world follow along in these daily studies in their own heart languages, now over 120 languages and dialects. How do we know God's at work through his word? Well, we read letters and we hear people's stories about their changed lives. You know, I love reading these letters and I know that you do as well. Some are about growing in the knowledge of God and some are about new life in Christ. And some tell us about hearing about Jesus for the very first time. Here's a great letter. This is from a friend in Hyde Park, Massachusetts, who wrote to share how God's Word is helping her walk in the light as a young adult. Here's what she writes. I listened to your program when I was a little girl. My mother would leave the 590 AM station on all day and night. To be honest, I wanted to hear something else other than preaching all day. I grew up in poverty, but with lots of love and respect for God in my household. I truly believe that my foundation in God's Word helped to give me a love for Jesus today. Similar to my past, I now walk around using the Through the Bible app on my iPhone, listening and re-listening to various lectures from Dr. McGee. I think I'm addicted to the Word. I just can't stop listening and learning from these studies in God's Word. I listen before bed, when cleaning the house, running errands, and even at the gym. The convenience of getting the message on my phone is a wonderful gift. I get a deeper understanding of the Word the more I listen to the studies, and it teaches me how to walk in the light as a young godly woman. I am so very thankful for how God has used through the Bible in my life. Isn't that a great testimony of God at work? So, what's your story? How has God used our studies together to grow you up in faith and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? And you've heard me say it before, we love to hear and possibly share your story to encourage others. So would you write to us today at BibleBus at ttb.org? In the process of writing down your story, I think you'll be encouraged as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for the example of others who have diligently studied and taught it through the years. We would like to please you too in understanding and applying your word in our lives. Thank you for your spirit who guides us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we've come to the second major division of the little book of Ezra. We had in the first six chapters the return from Babylon that was led by Zerubbabel, and about 50,000 returned at that time. They had gone into Babylonian captivity because they had continually gone into idolatry, and God gave them a gold cure down in Babylon. And also the land had not observed its Sabbaths. That is, every seven years the land was to lie fallow. And they were disobeying the Mosaic law. They didn't think probably it was too important. They thought they were getting by with it. That went on for 490 years. Now God says, I'm going to put you out of the land for 70 years that the land might catch up and observe its Sabbaths. And he did put them out that long. And they now have returned. It was very discouraging in many ways, as we've already seen. And it certainly was not any encouragement to the others that had not come back to return. But now we have another great wave of revival among the people who had been captives who were still living in Babylon. And now we have a group that's led by Ezra. Up to this point, Ezra, though the writer of this book, has not figured in its history at all. 
But now we have in chapters 7 and 8 the return under Ezra. And then we have in chapters 9 and 10 the Reformation under Ezra. You see, revival, as it was experienced by these people, led to Reformation, and that's always true. We'll see that in Nehemiah when we get there later on. Now we have here, as we've had before, the two companion books that we're not looking at now, and those were the prophetic books of Haggai and Zechariah. Now will you note, as we come to this chapter, now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now I'm not going to take time to talk about Artaxerxes, but he's the one that we'll be talking about in the book of Nehemiah in the second chapter there, why this is the Artaxerxes who gave permission to this man, Nehemiah, to return and build the walls of Jerusalem. And that actually marks the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel, the great prophecy. And that is the thing that lends significance, actually, to this man, Artaxerxes. But I don't want to talk about him now because we'll talk about him when we get to Nehemiah. The man that interests me here is not the king at all, but Ezra himself, because now is our first opportunity to meet him, to get acquainted with him, and to find out about this man. As we said at the very beginning, he is one of the neglected characters of the Bible. I do not believe he has received proper recognition by Bible expositors, and certainly not from the church today. Very little is ever said about Ezra. And I wonder if you've ever heard a sermon on the book of Ezra. Have you ever heard the book of Ezra taught? Well, this is one that is very easily passed by. But I want us now to look at him. To begin with, who was he? He was the son of Sariah. Well, who was Sariah? He was the son of Azariah. Well, who's Azariah? He was the son of Hilkiah. Well, who's Hilkiah? He was the son of Shalem. Who was the son of Zadok? and the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, and on down. And we come to verse 5, and we're told he is the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the high priest. Now, we know who he is. He is an offspring, actually, of Aaron, the great high priest. He belongs, therefore, to the priestly line. Now, had there been a temple in Jerusalem, he would obviously have functioned in it, probably have been a high priest. But you see, there was no temple. It's been burned, no city destroyed. And now this man did not feel like returning with the first delegation. Well, there was no place for him there, and apparently he was ministering to those that had not returned. Now a group, and it's not a large group, about 2,000, are going to return with Ezra back to the land. Now that the temple is finished, then there's a place now for him to minister. And we're going to find out he was a teacher, a teacher of the Word of God. And the interesting thing is, we're told here he's a grandson, that is Phinehas, is the one I call attention to here, And Phinehas was the grandson of Aaron, and it was in this line of Eleazar and Phinehas that Ezra came. If you went back to the 25th chapter of the book of Numbers, many of you will recall this, that Balaam couldn't curse Israel, but he taught Balak to get his people intermarried with them. And that brought the world and the flesh and the devil into Israel. And there was a man that went out and had married a Midianite woman. And the thing was that this man apparently had seen his great sin that he had done. And there was a judgment that came upon him. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, he took a javelin in his hand. And he went out and did something that seems very harsh to us. He executed this man and this woman. And the plague that had broken out among the people was stayed. And actually, 
two lives of sacrifice in order to save a multitude of lives. I'd like to just add this word, a very practical word, that I think is a very logical application of the Word of God to our present condition. Now, there are a great many judges today that feel like that if you let a criminal off, and certainly that we shouldn't have capital punishment today, that means that we are very brutal and uncivilized. Now, why should judgment be executed? It hasn't anything actually in the world to do with the individual because his life has ended. The minute that he's executed, why, in Israel, that ended that man's life. The judgment actually was not for him, friends. This idea today that capital punishment and prison doesn't reform a criminal, and therefore we ought not to have it. That never was the purpose of it originally. The original purpose of all of this was for the protection of other human lives. And when one is not executed, then hundreds have to pay with their lives. Today it's not safe in our cities because there has not been executions. Now, don't tell me that doesn't deter crime. I've discovered that when a traffic officer writes a ticket, it'll slow you down on the highway. And don't tell me it doesn't slow you down. And this is a deterrent to crime, you see. And that is the purpose of it. And for that reason... In that day, this couple were executed that multitudes in Israel might be saved from this pollution that had broken out in the nation. And that is the reason, the logical reason for execution, by the way. When anyone is put in a gas chamber or electric chair, this idea that it's for them. I remember hearing a whimsical story about the man was asked to say something years ago in the West before he was hanged for a crime. He'd committed a murder. And they asked him if he wanted to make a statement. He said, yes. He said, I want you to know this is going to be a lesson to me. Well, my friend, that's not the purpose of it. It wasn't to be a lesson to him. It was to protect the women and children and the other men that were living in that day. That's the reason for it. Why don't we face up to the facts today in life that somehow or another we are going to sacrifice hundreds of lives to protect one criminal. God doesn't do it that way because he wants to save human life. And he knows how bad the human heart can be. And I tell you, when a human heart is wicked, and who can know the heart? Why, the heart is desperately wicked. That's what God says about it. Now, this was a great lesson that Phinehas, one of the ancestors of Ezra, had performed. Now, I spend some time with that because I think that's important today. In this little book, great spiritual lesson. Now, will you notice verse 6? This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now it says he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Well, may I say that this man was not able to execute the office of priest, so he spent his time studying the Word of God. And now he's going to be able to use that, by the way. And you will find here... This man is labeled that again and again. Verse 11, we're told. Now, this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra, the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes of Israel. And then if you drop down to verse 21, you find, And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river that whatsoever Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven shall require of you, it be done speedily. You see, he had a reputation down in Babylon, and especially even with the king, he was a scribe of the words of the Lord God. He had that reputation. He was a teacher of the word of God. Now we are told that there was another great wave of revival among the people, 
and about 2,000 now want to go back. There went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and the Levites and the singers, the poeters, the Nathanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. And upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Now, it took him almost four months, in fact, almost five months, to make this trip. You can see he didn't go by 747 jet stream at all, or the jet liner. He went by foot. It took that long to make the trip. It was a long, arduous trip in that day. Now we are told in verse 10 again, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now this man had prepared his heart for the day they would return. He knew it was coming. He had faith in God to know it was coming. And he prepared his heart and he studied the law of the Lord. That is, he studied the law of Moses. The book of Joshua was in existence in that day. It's the belief of many that he wrote First and Second Chronicles. Well, this man gave his heart and life to the study of it. But not only to study it, but to do it. Oh my, that's so important. One thing to study it, another thing to do it. And then he wanted to teach it. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He wanted to do that. Now, this decree is made by Artaxerxes that Ezra can go up. Now, this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. Now he goes on and says, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are reminded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. Again, the commandment was not a commandment, a must. They must return if they wanted to, according to their own particular desire and leading of the Lord. Now we're told, verse 14, "...for as much as thou art son of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and the gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem." Now, apparently, Ezra had a real witness with the king, Artaxerxes. And he'll figure very largely, by the way, in the book of Nehemiah. I think that Ezra and Nehemiah must have been acquainted with each other. Now, we find here that they get together all of this material, and then Ezra sends out the decree, and then the preparation is made for them to leave. And we're told in verse 26, "...whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment." Now, that was the law in reference to them after they arrived in the land. In other words, if they're going up, they must mean business as far as their relationship to God is concerned. Now, verse 27 This is the thanksgiving of Ezra. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Now, not only was it rebuilt, but now it's to be beautified. And God's house, I think, ought to be made beautiful, as beautiful as it possibly can be, according to the ability of the folk who are identified with it. Verse 28, And he hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Now, actually, 
a very fine delegation, not as large as the other, but apparently a great many of the leaders returned back to the land. Now we have the list of these companions that went up, many of them of the Levites, the Nethanims, the servants were there also. And here in chapter 8 now, verse 22, something that's quite interesting reveals how human this man Ezra was. In verse 22, he calls for a great prayer meeting, by the way, and a fast. He says, verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. Now, he goes to God in prayer, calls this great prayer meeting in a fast. Now, why did he do it? He says this, For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we'd spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Ezra said, I went before the king, and I told him, I says, The hand of our God's with us, and he'll be against our enemies, and he'll lead us up. And Ezra waxed eloquent. And then after the king granted all this permission to go up, and he gets out there with this delegation at this river, Ahava, and he's ready to go on that long march, he looks at the families, the little ones, and he knows the dangers along the way. Now, the normal thing would be to go to ask the king, well, couldn't you give us a little help? Send a few guards with us. And then the king would say to me, I thought that you were trusting the Lord. You know, sometimes some of us become very eloquent about how we're trusting God and how wonderful he is. Then when we get right down to the nitty-gritty, we don't really trust him. And so Ezra's that kind of an individual. He's sure human. He says, but I was ashamed to go ask the king. So what other alternative? He said, I called a prayer meeting and a fast. And I said, oh, Lord, we just have to depend on you. And you know the Lord puts so many of us in that position many, many times. Well, we find here that the king did send up a great deal of gold and silver and very many vessels and a great deal of wealth went up. And they were put in the hands of 12 priests and they needed protection, you see. But God did watch over him. We read in verse 31, Then we departed from the river of Ahab on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. He delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem and we abode there three days. Now, after they abode there three days, why, he has the treasure brought out and it's brought into the temple, into the house of God. And we are told here in verse 35, also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, 12 bullocks for all Israel, 90 and 6 rams, 70 and 7 lambs, 12 he goats again. Why? It's for all Israel, for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And my, what a glorious, wonderful thing this was. And now next time, we'll look at chapters 9 and 10, I guess, together. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. You know, there are a lot of great lessons in this book of Ezra. If you'd like to listen to this study again, or any other study in our five-year journey through the whole Word of God, you can find them on our website, ttb.org forward slash programs. And while you're in our study of Ezra, you'll benefit from Dr. McGee's notes and outlines. You'll find them online at ttb.org forward slash notes. Or instead of downloading the notes and outlines, you might also be interested in our new resource, Briefing the Bible. This paperback handbook is a compilation of Dr. McGee's outlines and a handy reference guide to every book of the Bible. We'd love to send you a copy as our gift to you. Or if you want something immediately, you can download a complete set of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines in the online version of Briefing the Bible. Either way, go to ttb.org forward slash briefing or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Next week, we'll finish up our study of Ezra and move on to the book of Nehemiah. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company on the Bible bus. 
Have a great weekend. Jesus came home, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.